A very good, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I should like to start by uh, noting that the generation of contrafactor is, of course, an explicitly acknowledged and well-known procedure in the sister traditional Byzantine chant with um, collections of uh, aftomelon uh, melodies being exploited to generate prosomion hymns that are based on them. And so one question that occurred to me uh, was, uh, were analogous procedures implicitly perhaps deployed in the Armenian tradition? And uh, some interesting things uh, may be noticed uh, if we embark on such an investigation. Uh, first, the earliest examples are the odes by St. Gregory of Narek, who died in 1003, and we find, for example, rather strikingly, that uh, in one of the earliest uh, Venetian manuscripts that I've inspected, this is very, very obvious, that two different odes, Yerk Zarman Ali and Anun Anerin, seem to have the same melody, judging from the numations, uh, even though, uh, funnily enough, the former has an irregular number of syllables, it is in prose, whereas the latter has regular meter. And so the melody must have been largely identical, particularly evidenced by the long chains of neumes that you can see. Uh, for example, if my arrow is visible over there, over there, over there, and in certain intermittent positions, which you can see here in the other ode, but that as the number of syllables does differ overall, uh, there are various ways of taking up the slack or padding the melody, which it is difficult for us to know what the effect on the overall melody would have been, um, because we cannot really decipher the neumes. Uh, and also it begs the question, are such inexact contrafacta, if I may so put it for want of better terminology, um, to be considered to be contrafacta, ought our definitions of contrafacta to embrace such things? Um, and if they're not contrafacta, what are they? The other uh, thing that we find in this period and slightly later in the case of odes is that sometimes there are explicit instructions, a rubric that states that a particular ode ought to be sung to the melody of some other item that might be better known to the user. But for my main uh, presentation, I should like to turn to the hymns composed by St. Narcisse the Gracious in the 12th century, uh, quite simply because I've been looking at uh, the corpus of his work, uh, because this year we celebrate 80, 850 years from his passing. And as I was asked to put together a program for a concert at the Sistine Chapel at the Vatican, uh, my first duty was first to ascertain the authorship of the hymns in connection with my program. And when I was investigating issues of authorship, I found that there were musicologists who claimed that particular items belonged to the saints then on the basis of the fact that currently known melodies uh, of something known to be uh, his uh, were the same which of course is very, very misleading because the melodies have changed over the centuries. Would then comparing the numations of two items of which we know one to belong to the saint and the other one of our known authorship provide us with grounds for uh, assuming that the second item also belongs to the same saint? Well, precisely because of the possibility of contrafacta, uh, there is no guarantee that similar numations uh, mean common authorship. And uh, let's start by taking a look at some of the neumes and uh, particular examples. Uh, to save time, rather than take photographs from medieval manuscripts, I've been using uh, a very reliable, meticulous uh, publication, Venice 1898, by Archbishop Ignatius Gurerian, which really faithfully reproduces the neumes in a particular and highly reputable uh, codex. Now, the biographer of St. Narcisse, the gracious, the medieval biographer, anonymous uh, though he is, uh, referred to the fact that though his hymns were 
miraculous because of the words and the wisdom uh, of the words, uh, even more wonderful and miraculous was the art of his various melodies, which he composed, and there's the word Annaman here, which is very interesting if we're interested in contrafacta. It means they were inimitable, they were peerless, they were unlike anything else. So this does uh, stress the fact that the saint composed novel uh, melodies. But we find contrafacta within his own output. So my first example is a hymn uh, uh, where uh, he actually composed four different hymns to the same melody, judging from the neumes to be found. And I should like to demonstrate four instances uh, when he composed the novel melody, as he has done here, but endowed it with several sets of words. In other words, we could say, I think, perfectly defensively, that he generated contrafacta based on his own melody. Uh, the second instance is when he actually availed himself of existing melodies. Before I proceed, I just want to say that one of the currently known melodies uh, for this hymn uh, in the version sung in San Lazaro was immortalized by Gian Francesco Malipiero, who made use of it as one of the themes of his orchestral rhapsody, uh, Armenia, uh, which some of you might know. But the second case involves the saint already availing himself uh, of a pre-existing melody and so generating a contrafactum based on an older pre-existing melody. And interestingly enough, this gave rise to further contrafacta later on, whereby the saint may have served as a sort of link in a chain. So the, the melody here on the right, judging from the numations, is the same as the one on the, uh, on the left, is the same as the one on the right. The one on the right is by the saint, it's for the second day of Pentecost. The one on the left is rather uh, uh, rather uh, later. And, uh, sorry, the seventh day of Pentecost, I beg your pardon, not the second day. It is, in fact, a syntonization of the 41st oration of St. Gregory of Nazianzus. And there is a similar hymn, not musically similar, but in terms of the same bits that have been borrowed from uh, the, the St. Gregory's homily, in the Byzantine tradition as well. And uh, so here the saint derived a contrafactum from an earlier uh, melody. And interestingly enough, the same thing was later used by others after him. Now, the third case is when the saint composed the new melody, which you see on the left, uh, it's a hymn, a cantimus hymn for the first Sunday of uh, Lent. Uh, and that was exploited by a later composer. Although here there is slight uncertainty, the name of the later composer is Kiragos, judging from the acrostics of the hymn. But conceivably, that might be an earlier Kirakos. There are two potential candidates for the authorship of the hymn. Uh, in the case of the more likely candidate, it is a later contrafactum based on St. Nerces's melody. But if the Kirakos is a considerably earlier Kirakos, which is possible, um, then St. Nerces borrowed the melody from him. So we have no means of telling which came earlier, but they are contrafacta and they are from somewhat different periods. So that's an intriguing instance. And uh, the fourth case that I want to uh, present to you uh, is even more interesting still. So on the left-hand side is something we know to be by St. Nerses the Gracious. And the saint's melody, which you can see on the left, uh, was used by Hovannes Blues, a later hymnographer, for his hymn devoted to the holy vegetarians, if that's a good translation, the holy grass-eating uh, monks. Uh, and he has done so in a very, very, uh, I mean, ordinary grass. Uh, I'm not using grass as a euphemism for 
uh, inappropriate uh, substances. Um, and uh, the later hymnographer has made use of the saint's melody in an interesting manner. Um, as you can tell from these dots, there are four lines to each stanza of either hymn. And the newer, newer hymnographer has made use of the melodies in each stanza for the second, third, and fourth lines. But for his first lines, he has written something different. Is this a contrafactum? Well, the second, third, and fourth lines of each stanza reproduce identically the earlier melody, but each stanza has a different first line. So this shows you how creative those uh, hymnographers could be. Now, this is an example of some rather more complex interactions that perhaps would stretch our definition of contrafacta rather further. On the left-hand side is an earlier hymn, and on the right-hand side is a hymn that was composed by St. Nerses the Gracious. But if you start looking at the first few syllables of text, the nuances are different, hence the melody was different. But if we start effecting our comparisons from where I've uh, placed a blue arrow with the sense downwards, the direction downwards, from then onwards, a substantial portion has identical numations. There, there again, if you look at the other arrows, the ones pointing upwards, there we find another chain, which up until the end of the stanza, again, the nooms are identical. So it is a partial contrafactum in that substantial portions of musical phrases were reproduced identically, but in between and by way of little preludes, there are things that are different, usually taking account of the fact that the rhythm that accrues from the verbal text and the number of syllables differ in each case. Here too, uh, the question arises, to what extent may such things be considered to be contrafacta? Um, and in this instance, I have placed the hymn by St. Nerses on the left-hand side, and on the right-hand side, I've shown a hymn by a later hymnographer, and it is clear that the later hymnographer has gone back to the saint's hymn and again adopted those bits which start wherever I've put those blue arrows. This brings us to a more fundamental question. In many Armenian hymns, we notice that items are often amenable to categorization as families within a given mode, families that are defined by the fact that they bear essentially the same humations. So essentially the same melody reappears, but I say essentially because they're not identical since padding is needed to account for different numbers of syllables in each case and any slack needs to be taken up. So there are recognizable passages that are identical musically, but then there are further syllables that have to be accounted for somehow. Remember, we are unable to read the neumes but the commonalities are apparent as motifs associated with recurrent emissions in two respects. First, combinations, highly telling and recognizable combinations of neumes on particular syllables, and recognizable sequences of neumes on successive syllables. And of course, we might be able to uh, hunt for those much more efficiently when MEI, the Music Encoding Initiative, or other tools allow us to um, analyze a very large corpus and look out for such things. That might also help us to know who, uh, which hymnographer may have been the first to present a particular uh, uh, melody for the first time. And such connections were observed in the 19th century and exploited as an aid in constituting melodies for a large number of hymns on the basis of a limited number of well-known melodies that were floating in the air at the time. 
thereby, in a sense, replicating and emulating the procedures of medieval hymnographers who generated contrafacta centuries earlier. In what sense are these things contrafacta? Is it admissible to consider them as such or not? That is something that I'd like to propose for possible discussion. I shall end by showing that the tail end of the tradition did actually continue to generate genuine contrafacta, even in a strict sense. Uh, this, on the left-hand side, is a rather mysterious apocryphal Armenian ode that was published in 1794 in Constantinople. Um, and it turns out, as I was able to demonstrate uh, fairly recently, it is a contrafactum based on an Irmos by Petros Peloponnesios, as evidenced by the British Library manuscript on the right-hand side. Um, we find such examples in the 1807 Constantinople Eucologium, Book of Rituals. Uh, in uh, the ritual for holy matrimony, there's an explicit rubric that introduces a hymn that is apocryphal. It is not to be found. It is extra canonical, rather. It is not to be found in the canonical hymnal. But he says, sing it as per some other hymn. And albeit rather sparsely, it reproduces on particular syllables, groups of neumes, to help the reader who already knows that hymn to uh, form a melody, probably in real time, in a convincing manner. I've discussed this in uh, one of my books. And the most shocking example is that of an ode attributed to Amparzum Limongian that is in fact squarely based on a traditional Ottoman Turkish melody that some people attribute to Dede Effendi. So such practices continue. But the really interesting stuff is the medieval period where uh, one has to ask, are these contrafacta? Are they not? And then to address questions as to which came first, the chicken or the egg, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.